So we're hoping to release the project proposal feedback today. And you guys can um, come talk to us if you have more questions later. One second, I think I'm streaming now. Okay. Yeah, so how we graded it, um, we, we just try to figure out what kind of uh, you're missing in your project proposal. So if we felt like you were missing a lot of the method part or some evaluation tasks, um, we would comment on that. Um, and then I think some of you just kind of didn't include enough details and then we asked for a little more, more, bit more details. So stuff like that. So um, I think Bay's gonna provide a little bit, some more feedback today. And then she's gonna, oh, she's here. Awesome, that's early. Um, and then she's gonna, um, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm going to incorporate all of the feedback together and then we will release the grade um, and then all the feedback tonight. So you should be seeing um, yellow boxes on top of your PDF file in Gradescope. If you don't see those comments, please let me know. And then we'll figure out why that is and then hopefully that's, not too hard to figure out. But Bay, do you want to talk about project two or do you want me to keep going? No, that's okay. You can go ahead and start talking about the project. Okay, so let's talk about project two. It's already released on, um, on both Canvas and Gradescope. Also, oh, a reminder that there is another deadline soon, which uh, two weeks from now, April 1st, which is the progress report. Um, and then you can find more details about that on Canvas and Gradesco. So let me talk about project two really quick. This one is definitely would take a little bit more time than um, project one. So please start early. So this one is all about using TDA with machine learning models and comparing persistent barcodes. So there's also, there's three parts or like two parts for the project and a bonus part. So the part one is to compare barcodes with um, three images from the same image data set as before. And then um, you can use, I think there's some problem with, um, oh, actually that's fine. So you can use Ripser, whichever version of Ripser you want. And then you can use either Persim, which is a um, Python library or Hera, I think it's C++. They do similar things um, and then, so for part two, you're going to use SVM and kernel SVM to classify these images and you will see how TDA um, help with these tasks. And then the last part is just to use the deep learning. So from the code from this paper, and then to classify the same set of images that you picked um, and then you processed. So let's go into a little bit more detail. Uh, so the, for the submission, it's the same thing as before. Your, you should be submitting both the report and the code into separate assignments on Gradescope. Um, and then please do not include the entire image data set in your zip submission because last time people have definitely um, had problems with this when they couldn't submit on Gradescope because the file was too big. Okay, so let's go into more details. So this is the same data set as we, we've seen before. So for part one, um, take 10 simple images from eight distinct classes. So a total of 80 images from the image data set, convert them into boundaries as you've done before, and then compute the dimension zero and dimension one barcodes, return these barcodes as text files. This you've done before. So please return these barcodes separately because you will use them or like at least separate them. So you, at least, so you will uh, use them separately, separately later. And then so for step one and two, so compute distances, these two steps, you're going to compute them for the dimension zero version, and then you are going to compute them for the dimension one version. So first of all, you compute the bottleneck distance for all pairwise um, barcodes. And then you're going to feed that distance. Since you can compute distance now, you can use something like the dimensionality reduction techniques to project them onto 2D plane. 
So we're going to use the MDS and TSNI, these two techniques. Um, these are available in packages that we will we link um, over here. So you can look into them yourselves. Um, and then after that, we're going to project all the barcodes on a 2D plane and you're going to color the barcodes um, based on, color the points based on the image classes. So hopefully you can see some nice structures from these dimensionality reduc reduction techniques um, after you project them onto the 2D, 2D plane. Um, and then definitely talk about your findings in your report and the results that you see. So the second one is compare with the Wasserstein distance I compute the Wasserstein distances for the barcode and then still use the same two dimensionality reduction techniques and project them onto 2D plane, do the same exact thing, and then compare these two, um, uh, compare these two uh, images that you get. So use the raw images or slightly process the images as initial inputs, use these two techniques to project these images onto the 2D plane where each point in the projection represents a particular image, color the points in the projection by the image class, compare the project projection results. So um, you need to compare the zero dimensional and one dimensional separately, and then talk about what you find. So that's part one. And then these are the packages, should be easy enough to use. And then for part two, you use SVM and kernel SVM in classifying these 80 images from part one to four classes and eight classes respectively. Um, so eight classes should be, I guess, sort of the organic version because we did pick eight, uh, 10 images from eight distinct classes. And then after that, you're going to use persistent scale space kernels for classification. This is what we talked about last class, this persistent space kernel, uh, scale space kernel and then use persistent images for classification. We also talked a lot about this last class and how this works and the weights functions. I hope you guys remember. Um, describe your process and explain your results in the report. I think for project one, a lot of you didn't actually describe what you found. You just kind of put the persistent barcodes that you computed into the report and then we really would like you to talk about what you've done and then what you found from, you know, using these uh, methods. And then- so question about the previous mm -hmm, one. Mm -hmm. So these 80 images that we're using SVM to classify, is it, do we have to split it into some, like a train slash test and we're only running the SVM on one and evaluating it on another one? Um, Yes. Yes, you can do 80, 20 or 70, 30, whichever you prefer. Okay. Yeah. So I would, I mean, like think, I mean, you would probably have to take, let's say like you're taking 10 images from each, right? So you could probably take like seven images from each class because they would not make much sense if you, you know, take like 60 images from six distinct classes as a training set and then you test it on the, what the two classes left. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So sorry, just add a little bit. I intentionally leave this part vague because um, when you start using ISVM for classification or kernel SVM for classification, um, naturally you would want to split your data into a training set and testing set. Right. So Yep. Okay. And then, so this is the reference for the bonus part. So it, you can go read the paper. This we, we also talked about, um, I think it was last class. Uh, it was the neural network one that they had in a topo topology input layer. So uh, read the paper and d try to install the code and see if, see what they did in the code. And then try to classify the same set of 80 images um, with their method and see what you get and compare the results as from before. So Faith, um, do you mind show the, um, uh, the first slide of it? So, so, so this one is designed such that this there one? is uh, the standard part of this uh, project, which is part one, part two, which consists of 20 points. 
the reason I added a bonus part, and it's pretty, uh, you know, I would say a fairly generous portion, uh, which is 10 points. Um, the reason I'm adding it is because usually right around this time, this is where I'm getting some emails to say, you know, what can I do to improve my <laughs> final grade? And this is your opportunity uh, oh, if you sorry. want to uh, add extra points for it. But, you know, the driving force is that if you want to dig a little bit deeper over trying to look at one of those, you know, to be fair, this is 2017 work. So it's not, you know, it's not like, and it's deep learning. So a lot has happened over the past four years, but it's one of those uh, nice techniques where, you know, we spend quite a bit of time discussing how they convert input data to um, vectors uh, by adding a layer. And then the sort of the bonus project is sort of hopefully uh, to motivate you to kind of get your hands a bit dirty over understanding their source code and how to get it to run. Um, so, so that's uh, where the bonus project comes in, okay? All right, so um, Faye, do you want to also describe the um, uh, final project progress report and then the requirement? Yes. One second. Yes, let me share my screen. Okay, so the final project progress report is due on April 1st, which is exactly two weeks from now. So remember the deadline is before class, so don't be late. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the, right here is the detailed description. It's a one to two page description of your project, your progress. So um, the first thing you should talk about is the high level project description remind us what you are trying to do and your goals, just a simple description because we've read your proposals um, and a list of completed milestones. So this is this part you've described already about in your, um, in your proposal. So you need to talk about what you've done so far and then what you will be doing in the next few weeks uh, before the final project presentation and report. And then the most important part of this proposal is the preliminary results and the efforts already put towards the project. So talk about in detail what you've accomplished so far and then what, um, what are some results that you see and then that and how you want to extend that uh, in the next few weeks. And then if you are trying to modify the project, because I know that sometimes, we know that sometimes um, as you continue with the project, there are certain things that didn't go as planned or you found new problems. Um, so if you want to modify the project, provide justification and update your milestones. Uh, and then answer the question, if your project is, is your project on track? And hopefully the answer is yes. And then seven, provide a summary of this report. So just talk about a little bit about, about um, each of the points above, um, just a little paragraph, like a conclusion. So if you want to submit code um, with this project, please submit it as sim similar to how you've been submitting your project codes to the separate assignment on Gradescope called Final Project Progress Report Supplementary Material. It's already on Gradescope. Um, and then the report should be a single PDF file. So yeah, that's it. Let me know if you have any questions. All right, so I just want to put a comment. Um, based on what um, Faye and I discussed yesterday, based on your project proposal, um, you know, I think we have a uh, uh, fairly exciting project that is proposed. Um, but also, um, we also seeing um, some uh, areas for improvements. Uh, for example, for your project proposal, um, there are um, some report, uh, some proposal have um, um, insufficient related work in a way that there is a nice idea, um, but there was not a clear description of how the proposed work is different from the state of art or what are the related work in that area. Um, two that we see is that there's also a few reports that are um, that is completely in lack of uh, 
method section <laughs> in a way that there is a nice direction of where, uh, where um, you know, folks want to focus on, but it's not detailed enough to say, okay, I would like to uh, work on the following methodology. So that is sort of the places that's lacking. Um, in here, for the progress report, I think the most important part is for us to say, okay, have you made a clear uh, progress uh, for what you have proposed to do? Um, and I, you know, I would hope to see, you know, substantial progress so that we know that your final project is on track. And feel free to, you know, um, like I said, stop by at our office hour, both me and Faye has office hours, so you can get more input over, you know, how to, um, how to reach your milestones. Okay. Okay, so I am going to share my screen now and uh, any questions. Okay. All right, so So today we're going to sort of continue our uh, one uh, review over a work that is using sort of topology um, as a regularizer for classification. And then later in today's lecture, I'm going to move on to a, a set of tools, which are what I call topological descriptors, um, contour tree, um, rib graph, more small complexes for the next two lectures. And then those are sort of topological structures or topological descriptors, or sometimes people call them topological summaries of data that are basically interfacing both with uh, theoretical research, algorithm research, as well as applications, specifically in visualization. Okay. So, but today I would like to kind of wrap up with a few more minutes about this topological regularizer that we started discussing. Um, so, so again, um, the sort of motivation is I have um, two classes where the decision boundary, which is the line that's separating those two classes, um, can be kind of slightly more complicated than a linear classifier. So the idea is what is sort of the middle ground that capture the complexity of the decision boundary, but not overfitting the data. And then in this specific work, the idea is try to use topological method in the interior of the classifier. Um, and then, as you know, bringing a bit of topological feature in the model design um, process uh, to kind of encode topological information. So this is very different than the previous works we have discussed so far, which is really just say telling my data uh, into sort of a vector representation or some feature vectors and use those uh, as, as input features to a uh, to um, machine learning model. So you're not really model modifying the machine learning model selves. In fact, you can even treat the machine learning model almost like a black box where you turn topological information from your data as input to the machine learning model. And then this is one way to interface with, uh, with machine learning. The second way as we're describing now is instead of just turning topological information as input to a machine learning model, <coughs> excuse me, what you do is you actually open up the machine learning model and treat it almost like a glass box, right? And you kind of modify the machine learning model using topological information. So that is a diff uh, that's a second way to interface topology with machine learning. So in this particular case, everything that is uh, learning upon is actually modifying, right? If you think about, um, you know, and, and, and again, this is this is a piece of the paper. The paper I would encourage you to uh, to read it in in, in uh, you know read the complete paper, but here I'm just picking out the most essential technical detail that is important to understand where topology plays a role. So if you think about, uh, you know, some of those machine learning model, all that boil down to is their uh, ob objective function, okay? And either um, if the objective function is sort of uh, defined as sort of a loss function, then the idea of the machine learning model is try to minimize the loss. Okay, so if you actually think about uh, when we uh, first started talking about things like perceptron, there is essentially a data pointwise loss, you know, based on how well the model is feeding the data. And then in this case, it's not, uh, it's not too different. 
So essentially, um, you know, in this particular classification problem, you have your data point, and then you have sort of the label of the data point, and you have n number of points. And then the classifier essentially is sort of described by W, which is where the decision boundary is defined by. And then there is objective function that is try to minimize the weighted sum of per data loss and plus a topological penalty. And so for the first piece of this, this is just, you know, essentially a, a type of loss function. And if you look at the form of it, one example, so this loss function takes many different forms. Um, one of them form is what's called hinge loss. If you look at this, this looks very similar to the loss function you see when we talk about the perceptron algorithm. Right. This is sort of looking at essentially how far away um, is my sort of, uh, you know, in some sense, it's looking at what is my predicted label and how far away is it from uh, the true label. So this is basically a similar form you have seen before. And then that's the first part, which is talking about, you know, per data loss. But the most important part, as I mentioned from last class, is a second term, which is, you know, the second term is what encode topology. And in their paper, this is called topological penalty, okay? And how do you compute the topological penalty? And that's what this, you know, again, this piece of um, technical detail is. So if you look at topological penalty, what this look at, it's sum over, you know, multiple, components, right? What this does is that for each of this component C, it's looking at, you know, if my F, remember I'm representing my classifier as a function, right? And then if you look at this picture, I'm representing my classifier as a function and the uh, decision boundary as a level set of the function. So a level set, right, as I as I written here, a level set of this function is all the points in the domain with a function value A. And in this particular picture, it's corresponding to the orange lines of this function. And we also use sub-level set which is all points in my domain whose function value is smaller or equal to A, those are corresponding to the shaded region in the domain. And if I visualize this function as you know, some sort of terrain, then the sub-level set of it is essentially everything that is below the threshold of the terrain, okay? So in this particular case, um, you know, the sub-level set exactly is a region that is containing the orange point versus, you know, outside that, those are the regions that contains the blue point. And then the, like I said, the level set is a decision boundary. So the idea is I'm looking at all possible perturbation of my function f, remember f, whose level set decides on the you know, at a particular function value is what decides on the uh, decision boundary. And what we want to do is to introduce a perturbation so that, you know, we are looking at sort of the smallest perturbation to essentially get rid of a particular component. So if, if you look at specifically this left component that is highlighted in yellow, this is a component that is a sub-level set of this function. And this is happened to be a component that has a very small robustness. So what does that mean? That means among all the components, right? There's, let's say in this case, there's three of them. There's three component, which describe to three regions that enclose my orange points. But among all of them, I'm going to quantify their robustness. And the first one that I'm talking about, this one, is the one that has the smallest robustness. What does that really mean? That means I, among them, I require a smaller perturbation to get rid of this component. So how do I get rid of this component, right? If I picture it, 
you know, it's easier if I actually drew those uh, function, uh, those function as a one dimensional function to have a two dimensional function. What you have is you have something like this, right? And the, the component we are talking about, oh, well, actually, let me do it slightly better. Okay. And then the component we are talking about is the one that below this threshold right here. So, and then this curve is what I indicate as a function. And now I'm going to introduce a perturbation of this function to get rid of this component that is in the sublevel set. So how do I get rid of it? One way to get rid of it is potentially introduce a perturbation. See, I'm using a pink. Right? So this pink curve is a, a potential perturbation of my function so that this sort of component disappear. Right? So you can look at, the, you know, if you look at this definition, this is looking at all possible perturbation of this function and find the smallest one, um, find, find the smallest possible perturbation to get rid of this, uh, this as a single connected component. Okay. So in another way that this component right here has a smaller robustness, for example, than the component here, because if you imagine for this component in sublevel set to disappear, I need to really at least push the function a little bit higher in terms of perturbation versus this one. Okay. So that's his rough idea. Of course, if you read the paper, it has more uh, sort of implementational detail and experimental results and so on and so forth. But this piece is really at the core of the algorithm. It's trying to say that, you know, I am going to minimize a cost function in terms of its accuracy, which is the first piece, as well as a penalty to, uh, that is encoding topological information. Right, it's based on sort of uh, minimizing uh, a topological term that encode the robustness of those decision boundaries. And then the end result of this work is that it's trying to regulate. So again, it's trying to regulate sort of the shape of the decision boundary so that you know it's not too smooth like in the in the C because it's sort of have a much lower classification accuracy and doesn't capture the complexity of the boundary and it's not overfitting because in the middle in the picture B is sort of overfitting the data and then and then what you get is picture A which is at the sort of try to achieve a balance of, uh, of, uh, of having both a good accuracy, classification accuracy, but also at the same time capture the complexity of the decision boundary, right? So in a way that you can imagine if I were going to run this algorithm, it's going to take what's in picture B, which has this all tiny uh, decision boundaries and kind of ignore those decision boundaries because those are the ones with small uh, sort of with small robustness, right? So in a sense that, you know, those, those small, let me highlight it by yellow, those, those regions, you know, those regions are the regions where um, it has small robustness, meaning that I could treat those decision boundaries as noise uh, through my optimization. And then that's what you get is end result in A, okay? So it's sort of try to use topology as a way to regularize uh, the shape of the decision boundary and to ignore non-robust regions, okay? So I think I want to give this as an example to see how you can use topology to interface the interior or the mechanism of a machine learning model, okay? All right, so we already went through more theory. So today I'm going to switch gear a bit. Um, and for today and next Monday's uh, class, my plan is to go over a few what's uh, you know classically called topological structures, and you have seen them um, at the beginning of the semester when I went through an overview. And I want to go slightly deeper over those um, over those concepts. So, if you recall, there is essentially um, two tools that I classify in topological data analysis. One is separating feature from noise, 
and that is persistent homology. And we kind of spend quite a bit of the lectures focused on persistent homology. The second tool that is widely used in both state analysis as well as visualization is called topological structures. And sometimes it's called topological descriptor, sometimes it's called topological summaries. But the idea is it takes a certain abstraction from the data. And then there is multiple types of them. One is based on sort of more almost look like a graph, which is rib graph, contour tree, merge trees. Um, so they are graph based topological structures, and one is more complex based topological structures. Okay, so and what you see here is that if I have a two dimensional scalar function defined on a domain, and let's say I have the domain is x, I have function f from x to r. And what you see here is just a visualization of this uh, two dimensional scalar function as a terrain. And the first collection of topological descriptors is focusing on the level sets or the sub level set of the function. So again, if you look at this, um, uh, this blue curve, this is what the level set of this function is. So remember, what is the level set? The level set is all points in my domain such that its function value is equal to a given threshold, right? So this is, this is called the level set of this function, um, but in, uh, in, it's also called the contours of this function. So contour and level sets is actually the same concepts. Okay, so in term of if we study contour trees, this is essentially looking at shrinking each contour to a single point and then connect those points together. That is your contour tree. And that is also your rib graph if your underlying domain uh, is not uh, is not just uh, it, it's is it's, it's, um, is not uh, simply connected. So for example, when you recall, we discussed a rib graph of we discussed a rib graph of a function on a torus, right? Where again, if you have a threshold here, you're looking at the level set at this threshold, and you shrink that to a single point, right? As you go the threshold from minus infinity to infinity, or from the smallest function value to the largest function value, you know that you are shrinking all those points, all those points that in the same um, uh, in the same connected component to a single point. So this is what your rib graph is. Okay, so you kind of seen this rib graph when we are talking about macro graph as a topological data analysis tool, and we're going to revisit them again. And finally, merge tree, instead of uh, looking at the level set of the function, it's looking at the sub-level set of function. So it's shrinking sub-level set into components. And then more small complex is the one that is based on the gradient behavior of this uh, scalar function. So the top piece, this is all focusing on contour or level sets. And here, this is all, always focused on gradient. So essentially, it's looking at the gradient behavior of points in the domain and cluster the points if they have a similar gradient behavior. And we'll go through the detail and its application of more small complex in the next lecture. So if you look at the timeline, all those topologic structure roughly you know, came out in early 2000, but they see a lot of application in analysis and visualization. So let's start with rib graph, and this is will be a general review of it since you actually have seen it when we first talk about mapper graphs. So if you a rib graph is a graph that is obtained by continuous contraction of all the contours in a scalar field where each contour is collapsed to a distinct point. This is essentially the non-mathematical definition, but it's a very precise definition. In this way, again, we have a donut as a surface of a donut with three holes, right? This is sort of a, a, a torus with three holes. And here, what you have is you have a height function again, defined on this function, uh, defined on this space. And you choose a particular threshold. And then you look at, again, the level set of this function, which is called contours. 
And there's two connected components. There's two pieces of this contour and you kind of shrink them into two points in your rib graph and you connect them all together. And in this case, the rib, rib graph actually summarized and, and preserves the three tunnel of this shape. And then, you know, and you might have seen this and let's just recall it again. Mathematically, what do you have? You have a function defined on a topological space and then the function has to be a continuous function. And then if I choose a particular threshold, for example, let's say this is a threshold I'm choosing. This is a threshold I'm choosing. Actually, let me write it on the left. Mathematically, what you have is to define two points to be equivalent if this have the same function value and they belong to the same path connected components. So what does this mean? This means that in this case, my level set or my contours, there's two components in my level sets. And then for example, if I have a point, let me use red point. If I point here, X, and point here y, those two points are considered to be equivalent because they have the same height function value and they belong to the same connected components of the level set. And alternatively, so in this case, x is equivalent to y. And if my y, y is you know, at y prime, then you know that x is not equivalent to y prime because even if they have the same function value, they do not belong to the same connected components. So the idea of the rib graph is mathematically defined as what they call a quotient space. So it's taking the original space, in this case, the torus, um, quotient out this equivalence relation. So what did this quotient out mean? It really means that all the equivalence points are not identified as one single point. Okay, so again, uh, you know, if you think about animation, it's just you take all the points that belongs to the same connected components of the level set, shrink, shrink them into a single point. And that's what you get on the right-hand side. This is the rib graph, okay? All right, so you also have seen this before that if I have a height function on a mesh, then what I get is I will get the rib graph as a skeleton of the mesh. And now you can also use rib graph in shape analysis. So this is a good place to sort of compare uh, sort of rib graph, which is a topological structure with respect to persistent diagram, which is also sometimes pe people call it a topological um, descriptor or topological summary, because you've seen you can use um, persistent diagram in say shape classification. And here it's saying that, okay, I can use persistent diagram for shape classification. I can also use information I get from rib graph again for, um, for shape classification, okay? So all of them, you know, that's why I call them sometimes topological descriptors is that they, they capture uh, different information from the underlying data. Okay, for example, if you think about, well, if I have this shape and I have a, say, a height function on this, right, this is a height function going from purple to red, or actually in this particular case, it's not height function. This is, I think, oh, actually it is height function, I believe. And you can do a sub-level set filtration of this height function and compute persistent diagrams. And you can use that persistent diagram um, for classification tasks, but they capture different things. Because if you think about persistent diagram, persistent diagram is trying to capture the pairing between critical points, right? And then sort of the persistence of those features by those pairing versus the rib graph is trying to capture the connectivities among the critical points. And then the sort of their, you know, this is where sometimes you people use topology to mean connectivity, and this is really what's uh, what rib graph is trying to capture. That's why it's it's topological because it's trying to preserve uh, the topological relations among the critical points of a shape. Okay, why? Again, if you go back, 
this is my global maximum point A, uh, or not say not let me call it point V, is my local maximum. Point W is my saddle. Um, point U is my saddle, and point P is my local minimum. So in a sense that you have those critical points of this function preserved and then their relation preserved through the rib graph, okay? All right, so again, you know, there's one more thing I want to emphasize is that you can also imagine rib graph to be not just this topological, this kind of skeleton representation, but also naturally, because it has all these points in there, that there's actually a function defined on the rib graph, which is inherited from the function defined on the original space, right? Because all you have is you have a function defined on the original space X. Once you take the quotient map, you inherit the same function that is defined on every single point along this rib graph, right? Which is exactly the function of the contour that shrink to that point. So this is sort of the formulation. Again, you have this double torus, you have a height function on it. You sort of shrink all the contours of the same value into a single point. Um, and then this is sort of, I'm using a slightly different notation um, to represent the rib graph, right? So sometimes I say rib graph of the space coupled with a function. And what's interesting about it is the original function that is defined on the underlying domain, which is defined on X, is now I'm inherited it, I represent it as F hat, that is defined over this rib graph itself as well. So in a sense that there is a function F defined from the original space, and then the same function is sort of induced onto the rib graph, right? Where, for example, in this saddle point, it has a function value. It's the same function value on the saddle point in my rib graph. So in another way to think about it, the rib graph is not just a graph structure, but it's actually a graph structure that is equipped with a function defined on it. So in some sense that it actually encodes more information than a typical graph, as you would imagine, say, a graph from a social network. Right? This is a specific graph where there is a function value coupled on the, on the points in the rib graph. Now, if we go back to the contour tree, contour tree is actually a special type of rib graph when the underlying domain is simply connected, which means that it doesn't have loopy structure, right? So this is, this is, a, this is a rib graph. It has all this um, uh, loops that it's trying to preserve from the underlying domain because my under, underlying domain has those tunnels. Contour tree is precisely in the case where underlying domain is not, uh, is simply connected. Okay, so, so what does simply connected mean? A topological space is simply connected. Uh, if it is past connected, that means for every two points, there's a pass connecting them that is inside the, inside the domain. And every pass between two points can be continuously transformed into one another uh, and preserving the endpoints. So what does this mean if I have two points x, y in this domain? If I have a pass going from x to y, let's call this pass alpha, and then there's a different pass from x to y and call this pass beta, it means that I can transform x to beta in a continuous fashion and preserving the endpoint, right? So you can kind of slowly morph from one pass to another. And then this domain is therefore simply connected. But now this is a problem with this domain, which has a tunnel in the middle. If I have a pass from X to Y that goes from the left side of this tunnel, so this is my pass alpha. And then there's a pass going from the right-hand side of this beta. And now you cannot find a continuous transformation from alpha to beta without breaking this pass. Right. So you don't have so so that means this domain has is not simply connected. Okay. So contour tree is basically a rib graph 
when the under, online domain is simply connected. So what is a very simple example, if my domain is connect is past connected and it has no loop. And for example, if it's a subset of a plane, that's what I drew here, that is a simply connected domain, okay? So the most simple example is a terrain, right? When you think about the terrain of the earth, um, a piece of the terrain is usually um, simply connected. Okay, so how do we compute uh, the contour tree? So the definition is exactly the same as a rib graph actually. You have a function from X to R and you define two point to be equivalent if they have the same function value and they belong to the same pass connected component of the level set. Okay, and then my contour tree is essentially x quoting out this equivalence relation. And when x is simply connected, the graph became a tree. So let's do this from top to bottom. Right, and I'm I'm using band instead of single value just to highlight uh, different topological changes as I decrease my function value. So I have a terrain where I'm starting from the highest function value and kind of sweep down. So I start from the red region in the left end of the domain. That is my local maxima of the terrain or local maxima of my function, which corresponding to mountain tops. And in this mountain tops, it contains two critical points, which are what's called local maximum. Remember the definition of local maximum? Those are the points who has zero, um, uh, whose gradient is zero, and uh, whose neighbors has function value below it, right? Those are local maximum points. They correspond to two points at the, you know, uh, from my contour tree. The next thing as I go along, as I decrease uh, my level sets, right? Um, I'm sort of growing. Um, so in this case, I, I'm using red for a particular sub um, collection of contours. And then the next level, as I pass through a collection of values, I go through another local maximum, which is this point. Okay. And as I increase or decrease my function value further, what's happened is that the level set at this at the bottom of this yellow region, start connecting or merging from each other. This is again, if you think about starting from two mountain top, at that there's some point those two nearby mountain top are going to join uh, with respect to uh, the saddle point, and that corresponding to the saddle point right here. As I decrease my uh, threshold further, uh, of course you're also going to encounter the fourth local maximum, which is a much lower mountain top that is surrounded by the yellow region. As I decrease it further, you know, again, some mountaintops start merging again through another saddle point right here. And, and so on, okay? And as you decrease the function value, you start, you know, kind of having those uh, level set merge and merge and merge in this particular case. And then this is where uh, you get sort of most part of your um, domain, okay? So what's important here is that it's capturing critical points and then the relation between critical points, okay? And now let's talk about the simplification, right? So you see this process now let's think about what is a simplification of this. So one of the major usage of contour tree or rib graph in general is to try to, you can also, since they are abstraction of the underlying scalar field, what you do is you can say, well, maybe based on this abstraction, certain feature from my domain is less important than some other features. All right, so this is again, um, a particular example, it's a synthetic example where it's a more simplified, you know, uh, terrain where I have three mountain top and I have the bottom of a lake. And um, of course, there's also because my terrain is bounded, there is uh, some local minimum at the corner of my domain. Okay. 
So what happened again in the picture B, what you see is a visualization of a two dimensional scalar field and C is its corresponding contour tree. So what do I have? If I want to label it, again, if I start from the top until bottom, the first local maximum I see is, I'm gonna use black, is this local maximum, which is a point H, right? This is the first critical point you see as you decrease your uh, threshold. So that is a first leaf node in my contour tree. As I decrease my function value, the second level I see is now I see two mountain top where G corresponding to the second uh, highest uh, mountain top. And then as I decrease further, this is a level where I see three critical points. Okay. And then, then as I decrease further right here, this is where the two local maximum, their mountaintop merge at a saddle point. So that's the saddle point E and so on. Okay. So this is how, um, how the merge tree looks like, oh, sorry, how the contour tree looks like for this particular terrain. But one thing that's important is once I get this abstraction, I would like to be able to separate what I consider as noise in the data and what I consider as signal in the data. So what is sort of a noise in the data? Maybe among all those um, uh, mountaintops, one of them may be because of just tiny perturbation of underlying data. In this particular case, it's corresponding to this yellow mountain top. The answer is that this is probably, you know, in, in my current simplification, this is maybe a very tiny perturbation of the data in that neighborhood so that you get this very tiny uh, bump. What they're corresponding to in the contour tree representation, it corresponds to this specific branch of the contour tree. And this is happened to be one of the shortest branch. So the idea of contour tree based implication is to simplify the branches of, of the contour tree um, based on its length. But actually, this is also closely related to persistence. It happened to be that this particular branch also corresponding to the pair of critical points that define a feature that has the smallest persistence. Okay, so if you run persistence homology on this function, in fact, since I'm going from top to bottom, you can run persistent homology by looking at the sub level set filtration of the inverse of this function. It will tell you one of those bar in the barcode or one of those point in the persistent diagram give rise, let's say I'm using minus F, that's my, but it's going to tell you there is a particular function value. Let's say this is function value A or that, I mean, let's call it function value P or maybe V, I mean, let's do V of F. Well, actually I'm, I'm duplicating all the, all the values. Let's call it P and then this is called Q, it's going to give you a point in the persistent diagram that is born at time P and die at time Q, right? The, the difference between them is its persistence. And it's one of those points at, um, in the persistent diagram that has the smallest persistence, okay? So anyway, so this is related to persistence, but in terms of contour tree based implication, it's basically simplifying the branch that has the smallest length. But what's the effect of this implication? So if I get rid of this branch, you essentially get rid of both pair of critical point, the saddle and then the local maximum. What is the effect of this? This basic smooths out that little bump from my terrain, okay? So this is what's called topology-based implication using contour tree is because if you look at the rest of the area other than this neighborhood, the rest of the um, domain is not simply, is not touched at all. In some sense, you have a very local, in this case, a very local modification of my data to get rid of the noise, okay? So 
again, you know, this is a quick recall of the critical points of a Morse function on two dimensional manifold. This is a local minimum, this is a local maximum, and this is a saddle, right? So in this case, what you have is you have point H, G, and F are or local maximum, B are local minimum. A is a local minimum because it's on the boundary of the domain. And then the rest of point D and C, those are saddle point. So for example, and E specifically, those are saddle point. So locally, they all look like geometrically, they have those shapes. So now, oh yeah, this is exactly what, I want to give one more example, um, more precisely about the relation between the contour tree and then the persistent diagram, okay? So in this case, I have kind of deformed, um, what is the best words to describe this shape? Think about this as a deformed pork bun, right? <laughs> it's a, it's a two-dimensional manifold uh, and I, I get rid of the loop because I'm talking about the tree structure. So the domain is simply connected. Uh, and now um, you have, you know, again, you have a height function defined on it and you have a bunch of critical points. In this case, you have local minimum, local minimum, settle, settle, local maximum, local maximum. So again, the process of computing as a control tree, you can go from top to bottom or from bottom to top. Let me do from bottom to top, right? I can say that, you know, at this level, at level A1, I have one component in my level set. As I keep going, there's one component. So my control tree keep growing. At A2, I have a new component, right? And, and then those two components keep growing until I goes to right here. So when I talk about the component, what do I see? I also talk about the birth. I can also capture the birth and death of the component, right? So in this case, you know I have a component that is born at time A1, and I have another component born at time A2, and what happened at time A3 is when those two components merge, right? So this corresponding to a point in my persistent diagram. Okay, so this is a precise description of sort of the points in the, um, in the contour tree. Um, Their pairing corresponding to pairs of points in the persistent diagram. So again, when I'm simplifying it, for example, if I want to simplify it, I could simplify this particular area by kind of smooth out. Well, redo it. By kind of smooth out this neighborhood, right? This is where I can potentially get rid of this particular persistence pair, which corresponded to getting rid of a branch in my process, um, in my contour tree. By the way, how exactly do you smooth it out? What kind of mesh operation do you do here? Sorry, can you say the question again? Uh, so how, how do you smooth it out? How do you uh, remove the saddle point? Ah, yeah, good question. That's the next slide. Oh, okay. You're one slide ahead of me. Okay, so the, when you smooth out, I mean, those two are symmetric scenarios. So I'm only going to talk about the first one. So when you smooth it out, you can, this, what I showed here, is you can kind of push one of the local bump towards the height of the saddle, right? So if you think about from the terrain perspective, you're just moving all the mass that is highlighted in, in this area. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. But that's just one way, right? Because you have to have multiple ways. If I were going to draw a picture, in the two dimensional scenario, if I have a pairing like this, the first version is I can I can push down I can push down huh? I can push down the local maximum so I get a terrain like this. The second version is I can actually push down a little bit over the maximum and push up a little bit of the saddle. Mm -hmm. So you can do something like this. Uh, uh, how do you formulate this? This is some intuitive 
Uh, right. So, <laughs> so, so in terms of, you know, of course, in practical applications, it's a matter of, you know, what is the sort of, um, what is objective function you want to minimize? Mm -hmm. Okay. And also how smooth, you know, do you care about your simplification? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So you have a lot of control over that. Um, and then of course the last one, last type is you can just push up the saddle point. See what I mean? So yes. you actually have some flexibility in this. There's no like unique solution for this. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. So, but what I want to do, okay, so, so that is contour tree. So now the only thing I want to, you know, differentiate between contour tree and merge tree is that the merge tree tracks, so contour tree and reap graph keep track of the connected components of the level sets. Um, merge tree keep track of the connected components of sub-level sets. Oh, that's, yeah. Okay, that is really the difference between these two. But there is one connection, which is basically, and I, I don't think I have a slide, but there's an important connection. It's, there's a paper called Computing Contour Tree Across All Dimensions. And then this paper actually talks about how you can actually compute a contour tree by computing a merge tree of F and merge tree of minus F. So it's a very interesting algorithm. If we have time, we can talk about it later, but it's not in today's slides. But there's an interesting connection between merge tree and contour tree. In a sense, a contour tree can be connect computed by the two pairs of merge tree. So if I want to compute the contour tree from X to R, I'm just going to, so the contour tree of, of this space can be computed by merge tree of X with F and the merge tree of X with minus F. Okay. So this is a specific algorithm that, you know, if you have time, we can cover later. So I want to end today's lecture by just talking about applications in astronomy using contour tree. So if you recall, the key, the key picture um, is this picture, is that you can describe the, so imagine this is a picture of, uh, is an image from the sky collected by a telescope. And you can see the places maybe that's bright, uh, it's where signal is. And then the idea is I can use contour tree as a way to summarize this underlying signal and using contour tree based implication to get rid of noise in the signal. So this is what's called topological denoising. And then we have one application of contour tree to denoise uh, data that's coming from uh, astronomy. So the specific data we're looking at is called OMA data cube. And OMA data cube is coming from this sort of uh, what's called uh, a, a, a Tacoma large millimeter array, which is called OMA. This is one of the world's most powerful telescopes that is located in Chile. Apparently, one of my collaborator has went and visited is in the middle of nowhere, pretty much in the desert. Um, it, um, the, the area don't rain for more than 300 days of the year. And uh, the data has to be sort of collected, but then transported by trucks, right? Uh, so <laughs> it's a very interesting place. Uh, but then what they do is they kind of have those arrays of, of, of uh, telescopes that is sort of aimed at a particular area in the sky. Uh, specifically, for example, they want to look at a particular black hole. It's a radio telescope. So what they do is they collect essentially the signal across different uh, radio frequency, okay? Different frequency. So that's why it's called a data cube where in the sense that the X, Y coordinates of the cube corresponding to, right, let me redo it. So the X axis and Y axis corresponding to a piece of the sky and then the Z axis corresponding to the frequency. Okay. 
So now, um, what can you do with this data set is, uh, you know, for example, the, the particular data set we look at is called the ghost of Mira galaxy. And then in the middle of the galaxy, there's a black hole. Um, so th the idea is you take those images um, and those data cubes, and then you study what's called the stellar and gas kinematics, which is basically how the stars and gas uh, are moving uh, with respect to uh, how they uh, um, acquire their motion. Uh, and then the contours of those uh, sort of, there's multiple frequencies and multiple scalar field you can get. The contours corresponding to, for example, light distribution or luminosity of the gas emission from those galaxy. So always fancy this is actually how a piece of the data looks like, right? So if you look at, again, you know, this is a zoom in slice of the data and in the center of it, that's where the black hole is, okay? Um, and then this is also related to what they call source finding is basically trying to find the feature in this case, the black hole in the middle of the galaxy, okay? So now, as I mentioned before, we can actually using topological techniques to denoise this data. So what you see is actually, this is a denoise result. This is actually using contour tree based simplification and as you see that, you know, you see all this, you know, in neighboring area, those are just imagine them to be like tiny little bumps that is coming from the noise in the data. And the denoise result is trying to highlight um, sort of um, uh, the, the location of the black hole. And, and to be fair, this is, this is more of a proof of a concept because this is a situation where we have a good idea that in the middle of this galaxy, is where the black hole is. And as you denoise the signal, in this case, uh, a, a particular frequency, uh, uh, this is what remains after smooth, uh, after simplification of the underlying you know, function, or in this case, underlying frequency. And if you imagine it's underlying terrain where the significant uh, signal are preserved. So, so again, um, because we are using a uh, contour tree, which is related to persistent diagram, what you see to the upper left corner, this is really the persistent diagram that describe the pairing um, between saddles and nearby critical points. So each time I move, uh, so if you look at what well, this is not very high resolution, this is a persistent diagram. Each time I move along this direction, I'm sort of simplifying all features that is have persistence that's below it. So all the points that is below the line and below this blue line and the diagonal are the features which correspond to critical points that has been eliminated. If you look at this image, all the colored points are critical points. So as you see, when I simplify going from left to right, I'm going to slowly simplify uh, and reduce the number of critical points. In this case, I'm going to reduce the number of saddles and local maxima. So this is what you see. Um, again, the idea is using contour tree. So if I start from beginning, this is original. And if you look at the right, this is how as I move through my simplification, I'm slowly reduce the number of features in my domain and uh, where we consider certain features to be of low, low persistence and they correspond to small branches in the contour tree. And then this is how they get simplified. Okay. So you see that from this going through multiple simplification level, this is the sort of the final denoised results. Okay. And what's interesting about it is that we can also look at this through very sort of straightforward volume rendering. Um, it, you know, originally you see on the left, this is sort of the cube without um, denoising. And then the right is a cube in the area where we highlight it is where they have, uh, we have denoised the data. And if you look at from the side, and this is actually where, where my, where, you know, I mean, I have an interest in astronomy and this is where you know, you see this kind of disc-like patterns right here. Sorry, you see those disc-like, it's almost like there's two discs coming out from the, where the, uh, where the sort of black hole is. And then this is what they call the red shift. Okay. And then this is where my ah moment uh, uh, <laughs> of looking at this data. Okay. 
All right, so, um, so we also have applied the same techniques to other astronomy data cubes as well. And, and what happened is that you, the data I just showed you is coming from um, uh, radio telescopes. And uh, in here, um, we can also um, kind of obtain data cubes um, beyond, in this case, we're using what's called the manga. Those are optical telescopes. And uh, of course, it depends on you know, how those uh, data are collected. They have a very different uh, sort of nature associated with those data cubes, but you can still apply a similar techniques uh, to explore topology-based denoising. And in this particular case, th this is uh, sort of a picture of a spiral galaxy on the left. And then the right-hand side is those optical, the arrangement of those um, optical fibers. So the telescope basically collected signal for each of those fiber. And the final image is sort of a, a gluing of all those signals together to form the final image. Okay. So that's that for today. Um, that, you know, I want to kind of give a sense of the two type of topological descriptors um, that is based on contour tree, um, um, contour tree, merge tree, reap graph. Um, and next lecture, we're going to talk about um, more smell complexes. Okay. I'm okay to end it earlier. And uh, any questions? So uh, where did we use the simply connectedness? So what? For, uh, where did we use the simply connectedness? Oh, for, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because this, this domain is a piece of, it's a, it's a, it's a simple rectangle as part of our, uh, of, you know, like I'm, we're taking right now, we're taking slice by slice. Oh, actually, that's a good question I want to mention. So this cube is actually, it's a cube, right? So there's multiple frequency in the Z direction. What I showed you is a particular slice at a fixed frequency. And because it's a rectangle, it's simply connected. So when you, when you compute the connectivity among the contours, you get a contour tree, not a reef graph. Does that make sense? And then what yeah, we so, also, yeah, go ahead. So can, can it, can't we do the smoothing operation on reef graph, yes. for example? Yeah, so actually oh. that's exactly what we try to compare against because um, I think astronomers also do some form of Gaussian smoothing. So you basically convert, uh, so a convolution. So you basically convolute it with a Gaussian kernel and globally damp the signal together. So the difference between Gaussian or sort of convolution and topology denoising is precisely this picture. So if you think about topological, in this case, using contour tree based denoising, you're only modifying very small area of the domain, right? So it's a very local uh, denoising because I just say, hey, this is a bump that has a low persistence. I'm going to get rid of it, right? Uh, versus if I'm convoluting it with a Gaussian kernel, I'm actually doing a global dampening of the signal. So actually, uh, well, this is, may not be the most precise picture, but imagine you have signals like this. The Gaussian smoothing, when you convert do a convolution, is you kind of smooth all signals, right? So it's in some sense a global smoothing techniques versus a local smoothing techniques. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I but yeah. I, I must say that this kind of convolution is actually fairly widely used by astronomers. And but what we're interested in is you know, can we actually apply more topology-based techniques? Mm -hmm. This is, okay. thank you.